Good morning and welcome to the ninth meeting in 2018 of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone to turn off mobile phones or other devices as they may disrupt the meeting. Apologies have been received from our committee member Ruth McGuire and there's no substitute for Ruth at committee today. Agenda item one, our sole agenda item today, is an evidence session with the UK Government Minister responsible for Social Security Policy. And I'd like to welcome the Right Honourable Esther McVeigh MP, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, to the committee along with her officials, Mary Patterson, Director, Ageing Society, State and Pensions and Devolution, and Denise Horsfall, Universal Credit Operations Area Director, Scotland, um, both of whom are um, from the Department of Work and Pensions. So um, uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation this morning. I understand uh, the Secretary of State has uh, opening remarks to make. Well, I'll keep them very brief, but basically I wanted to say I'm very pleased to be here at this important time for Scottish devolution. Uh, since taking the role of Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, I've been impressed with the collaborative work I've seen between the DWP and the Scottish uh, Government officials, and I'm personally committed to ensuring that that close working relationship continues. Um, we've got a joint ministerial working group. I was at that in January. They're held every quarter. Again, I I was impressed there with the nature of the constructive discussions that went ahead and it is really on that basis that I wanted to start uh, our uh, committee today. Thank you very much. Um, we know that we're slightly constrained with time this morning so we want to get through as many opportunities for questions as possible. Um, don't want anybody to think they are constrained for time because I think this is so important and obviously we're up here especially today for this uh, that I want people to feel free to ask the questions they want to hear answers for. Thank you. Um, you mentioned um, that um, it's a very close working relationship going forward between both both governments and both um, sets of officials who will be working to, 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 to deliver this. Um, obviously, we were a bit disappointed um, regarding the bedroom tax delay, which means that we won't be able to um, stop the bedroom tax until 2020 now. It's a delay of about a year, and that, that obviously was a bit of a disappointment and caused some concern. But can you give us your assurance that going forward that... Um, that that you don't foresee any problems in the timescales that have been set out for the de um, devolution of the powers to Scotland and the ability for that system to operate going forward? As I understand it, there hasn't been a delay. Whilst people were hoping, and uh, Scottish Government might have been wanting uh, a, a result slightly earlier, as we were delivering the uh, technical change within universal credit, whilst there were ambitions and hopes, there was never actually a time put on it, and people are now continuing to work at as fast a pace as possible uh, to ensure that uh, the delivery is such that uh, the Scottish Government will be pleased with. Okay. And going forward, do you see, obviously, with the complexities and issues of data sharing, are you, you content that there, there shouldn't be any more delays and that we should be able to, to work to the timescales that have been set out so far? It seems where there's been any delays in data sharing, they have not been um, down to the DWP, but where there was a request for a specific one under PIP, they were not held with uh, the Department of Work and Pensions, they were held with the people who were delivering it and therefore had to go through a separate set of transactions which people knew and understood to get them and have them signed off to come forward. So, as I said, people are working as best they can. All I can say is, so long as we know in advance which people are working to, what it is people want uh, in the correct uh, sequence that they need things. Uh, so, you know, potentially a code for PIP. Um, you actually need what you want to do with that benefit first. Uh, and therefore, if it came in that sequence, everybody would know exactly what people were searching for and were required. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring in Ms McNeil. Good morning, Minister, and welcome to the Social Security Committee. Um, I have two broad areas I'd like to ask you about. Um, the first is, I know you've been having discussions with the Scottish Government about their intention to introduce a job grant for age group 16 to 24, but there has been some perhaps disagreement about whether it's a devolved competence or not. I think it would be helpful to know what the UK Government's position is, whether a Section 30 order would be required for that or not, or whether you think it's 
I don't know all competence. Um, the second area I want to ask you about is obviously in your role as a minister overseeing the transition to universal credit. As you'll be aware, it's been a very controversial change, certainly, in Scotland. Now, knowing that we would be questioning you this morning, lots of organisations, from housing organisations, Church of Scotland, and many third sector groups, I'm sure you've been aware of, that are concerned about the transition to universal credit and the, and the and the impact that it has had. So, for example, you'll be aware there is hard evidence that there are arrears, housing arrears, as a result of the implementation of universal credit. And in areas where universal credit has been implemented, there is direct evidence that there are more food banks needed. So I suppose my question is, do you accept that there are structural issues for universal credit across the country that really need to be addressed if universal credit is, to, is going to do the job that it was supposed to do and give people the same, I suppose, the same income, the same benefits as the previous welfare system had. Okay, uh, well, well, we start with the uh, job grant. Uh, obviously, with the powers that have been devolved to Scotland, uh, it is for them to decide uh, should they wish to have a additional uh, benefit, which would be under the remit uh, of the Scottish Government to develop those, pursue those, uh, raise the taxes for those to pursue something in their own way. I don't know. I can add a little bit to that. So. We, uh, we ha we've, uh, ministers have agreed that we can, there's some competence that the, uh, the job grant can happen under. So the Scottish, so there is a draft order being prepared and it's going between the Scotland office and Scottish government to just to, to finalise the drafting of it to make sure it's completely in line with the, with the power. So that's moving forward. Thank you. Um, and with regard to uh, universal credit, um, universal credit is a new benefit system that all parties across the House agreed with its aims and its intentions and what it was seeking to do, knowing that the legacy benefit had uh, issues within it fundamentally. It could lock people out of work, particularly around the 16-hour rule. So this notion that every hour of work pays, this notion that there would be an underlying support, and this issue that it wasn't just about getting people into work, it was actually about supporting people in their journey up through work to allow them to have career progression and that is the basis on what things moved forward. Also understanding now lives are more complicated with caring arrangements with children, uh, with, with adults, the parents, also taking into account the gig economy and how the world of work is changing in this global economy. Universal uh, credit is very much a benefit for the future and people around the world now are coming to see how uh, we are doing this, centering it on the individual for it to be uh, very much a personalised benefit. And behind that becomes the personalised support, which work coaches up and down the country tell me they feel it is not only liberating for them, that they can provide the support people need, but actually liberating for the claimants who understand the support they can have. But what we have said as we proceed with the rollout of universal credit, it's very much understanding how it works in the real world and we will change and adapt as that goes forward to make it sure that it does work for uh, uh, claimants uh, across the country and here in Scotland. So where we have seen that has not worked, we changed and had changes in the budget of last year. So whether that was those freedoms with a more generous advance if people were in financial difficulty, where it was the removal of the week's waiting time and um, where it was a two-week uh, housing allowance extra to allow people to move from that two-week to uh, the month uh, uh, benefit payment. These are the things we're doing to make sure it works for all and understanding how it works on the ground. Thank you. And did you want in, Ms. Johnson? Yeah. Yes. On that issue of um, universal credit, I would like to follow up on Pauline McNeil's questions, if I may. Um, now, Pauline McNeil has pointed out that I, I think we've taken a great deal of evidence suggesting there are real structural issues with universal credit. 
but also, I mean, at heart, the white paper that launched universal credit said that no one will experience a reduction in the benefit they receive um, as a result of the introduction of universal credit. Now, the Child Poverty Action Group, the Institute for Public Policy Research, suggests that that's not the case, that a one-parent family could be looking at a reduction of £2,380 a year by 2020, and a two-parent family a reduction of £960. And indeed, Paul Gray, the chairman of the Independent Social Security Advisory Committee, has spoken about the fact that a substantial chunk of the welfare budget has, has been removed, and that once transitional protection for those migrating from tax credits lapse, he said, and I'm quoting, a lot of people are going to realise it is now going to be financially disadvantageous to them. And he said, it's a problem that a major change is being introduced, which will mean there are more losers than gainers. Um, and I'd just like to, to um, understand if, if you agree that people are going to be worse off under universal credit than they were previously. And the Office of Budget Responsibility certainly believe that is the case. Do you agree? I don't agree with that. What you're saying is a, a system in total, the support that it is providing to get people into work, the extra support for childcare costs, uh, the increase that we're seeing in the national living wage, the increase we're seeing in personal tax allowance, all of which are going forward, and you've got to see this in the total, like 200,000 more people into work, and we see that universal credit will help more people of Scotland into work. You're seeing 65 businesses created every day in Scotland since 2010, and that will increase under universal credit as we give people uh, support. So what we're seeing is... Uh, extra support going in, as you say, a transitional support for those people who move across. But at the same time, what we are doing is making sure that this benefit is fair for everybody and works on a similar way to whether you're on benefit or if you're in work. So there will be changes on the tax credits uh, for people with more than two children. Those at the start are transitional protection. Those claiming will be protected. But we have to make sure that we've got a benefit system, not that is separating away from people that are in work, but more aligning with people in work, allowing them to get a job, get on that career progression, and allow them to have wage progression. And for the lowest uh, in work at the moment, you've seen the uh, fastest pay rise in 20 years with the introduction of the living wage that we're bringing forward. So you've got to see that there's a whole support package in total. So you, you disagree with these expert bodies who whose evidence suggests that people are actually going to be worse off. Um, do you disagree that there are structural issues still with this? We know that in areas where full service has been rolled out, housing debt has increased significantly. We're seeing a great increase in the use of food banks. And what you, you know, you've spoken about the fact that the waiting time has been reduced by one week. People are still waiting for five weeks, which is a very long period on a little income. Do you not think that these are structural issues that have to be addressed too? What has happened is if people are in need, they can have an advance immediately if they need a month's money in advance. And that has now happened with the uh, extra support we've gone, uh, brought forward with the payment of rent. We've brought in a two-week rollover period for people to adjust from going from a two-week to four weeks. So we listened to that and we brought that forward, which was the right thing to do in the budget. But what we are finding out through universal credit is, uh, I guess, uh, what people are all, or how they're already in debt. Universal credit by supporting and giving um, advice, financial advice and debt advice, that a lot of this debt that you're talking about isn't new, it's historic and therefore uh, these work coaches can now work with people to get rid of their historic debt and what we are seeing within four months uh, a third of people's debt actually reducing as we help them understand what their payments are understand how to get out of debt so it, it's not as your um uh, trying to uh, portray the situation uh, at all. And when I looked, I've been through the whole process of claiming uh, myself, how it works, how it do is done online, what people do. And what you're finding is um, 
before people would have had to have gone separately for their housing benefits. They would have had to have physically gone to all the different uh, places to get all their money together. Now it's being done online. So what you're seeing as a potential time delay, people would have had that under the legacy benefits anyway, going to all the different departments to get it. Now we can do it much easier that people don't have to do that, do it online. Um, and at the same time, uh, you can get that advance if it's needed to be able to pay your bills. So really, as I said, you've got to look at this as a completely new system. And what it's trying to do is alleviate some of those difficulties from the legacy benefit. We've obviously taken advice from organisations like Citizens and Advice Bureau, and they're telling us that some of their staff indeed are spending a great deal of time um, teaching people who are not acquainted with the digital world. So there's an exclusion issue there. And just one more point I'd like to make, convener. I mean, the advance has to be repaid by people on very low incomes, and is it not simply the case that that is adding to their debt burden? Hmm. They will be paying back the adv advance. Uh, there is no interest on top of that, and they've got a year to pay back that advance. But the two-week roll-on for the uh, housing benefit, they don't have to pay back, and that's a significant contri contribution to them. With regard to digital support, in this day and age, to be able to use technology and IT and the internet really is vital if people want to take advantage of maybe lower payment for things, if people want to be connected, if people want to be able to get a job. So this extra support that the DWP are giving through their work coaches, I'd say in a modern age and in an age where technology is everywhere, I think that extra support we're now giving is vital for those people, so they are not isolated. Can I just add to that? Um, I, I, most of you have been to job centres have seen the amount of effort that we're putting in on the digital uh, on the front line around digital support, and that's not the only thing that's happening. You know, we pay money to local authorities to provide digital support in their localities when they go live as well. Um, I think you're aware of all of that. Um, you know, we're forever reviewing and making sure that digital support is available for people. We do recognise there is a gap, but there's activity in place to help people. Um, our, our partners, such as Citizens Advice Bureau and other third sector, uh, we, we continuously work with at a local level, and if actually the Citizens Advice are finding it difficult to provide that support, then obviously they'll be aware of the other local uh, support from the local authorities as well. Mr Adam, you want to done with the supplementary? Yes, thank you, Thanks. Convener. Good morning, Secretary of State. Uh, I've just, I know you've not got much time, so I just want to kind of ask the question pretty straight and just follow up from what my colleagues have said. Is Do you believe, in your opinion, that universal credit in its current form is, uh, is actually fit for purpose, or does it work? As I said before, I, I have as much time as the committee needs me to give them, so I'm happy to answer any questions uh, you've got. Um, and I, uh, uh, universal credit is uh, fit for purpose, but with this slow rollout, this learn-as-you-go approach, which we're doing, that is to make sure that should there be any um, uh, issues within the system that needs to be uh, supported and altered, well, we've done that. We will do that because it's vital that it does work for everyone. Secretary State, with the greatest respect, that's completely devoid from the real world because in my constituency, I've got people who have been suffering constantly in Paisley because of the rollout, you know, and we're not even a full rollout area. When I went along with my colleagues to Musselburgh, uh, I spoke with a gentleman, you're talking about IT support, his only communication with the DWP was through a tablet that he barely knew how to work, and basically he was convinced there was no one at the other end to be able to talk to him as well. And my question would be, you know, what about people like my constituent who ended up getting sanctioned because he had a heart attack and was in the Royal Alexander Hospital? You know, what about things like that? You know, you're saying you think it's fit for purpose, but these things keep happening. These things keep going on all the time. Nothing seems to be changing for people in my constituency or across Scotland. Well, 
what I would recommend is that, um, like MPs across the country and various people, work with any constituent who, like you said, there might have had an extreme situation, because I know you can meet and work with your work coaches who will guide you through, hold your hand to be able to support you through this system, particularly if you're not au fait with the IT system. So that support is there. So it's incumbent upon us all to make sure people who are vulnerable get that support, because we need people to get that support, particularly those who are most um, uh, vulnerable. You know, that is uh, key. Um, and that is what we're doing. And as I said, where we need to make changes, we have made those changes. And that is key. And should state. anybody have such an issue as you described with illness or a heart attack or a condition, something like that, um, they would have full mitigation and would not have any sanctions or anything um, imposed upon them. So we need to help those people and not make it a frightening experience for them, but to make it a positive experience to get them the money they need, the support they need, and if it's helping to work, ensure that they get that best help that they've never had before. But Sex just say, and I'm saying that in my experience, that's not happening. That isn't happening uh, out there with the uh, people that are not getting that support. And the situation is they come to our offices, our constituency offices, as their last best hope to try and help them. And by that time, there's already uh, been problems, specifically in the case with the gentleman with the heart attack, which we managed to sort out ourselves. But it shouldn't get to that stage. The system should be seamless. And that's what I'm saying. Do you still believe that after hearing you've heard that universal credit is fit for purpose? I do, because for the vast, vast majority of people, it is working. But where you have an instance, um, like you've mentioned, and I would ask you today, can I have the name um, and address of that person and we can support that person and make sure that all is now going well to give that extra support and certainty and find out what went wrong and how we didn't help. Um, so for the vast, vast majority of people, it is working. But in instances like that, we need to learn from that uh, and for it not to happen, but to provide them with the support they need. Just one final question, uh, just the fact that it's a follow on from what Alison Johnson said. You know, you keep saying that you'll try and sort out issues and that you're trying to move the uh, universal credit forward. But are you saying that Citizen Advice Scotland and all these charities, many of which are here today, are all wrong in what they're saying? That they're saying they're having people, members of their organisations, coming to them saying that they are not getting access or the support they need, and it's cause, causing financial mayhem for a lot of these people. Are they all wrong? Uh, no, State. what I'm saying is for the vast, vast majority of people who we deal with, and we're dealing in the DWP with 22 million people a year, for the vast, vast majority it works. But in the instances you're talking about, uh, those people would reach out then to the Citizens Advice Bureau, yourself and us, and therefore they will hear those stories and not from the vast, vast majority of people who benefits are working for and universal credit is working for and as we say we know the extra support we're providing has worked 200,000 more people in Scotland alone in a job since 2010 3.2 million across the UK in a job as I said all the numbers of extra businesses starting each day alone in Scotland 25 so the support people are getting through benefits into work is working but where it hasn't, on that very uh, sad issue you told me about there, we have to make sure that we've got agencies in place. Of course, we support citizens' advice. But it's advice not a standalone bureau. issue. It's well, happening all over the country. Well, we work and provide the support with Citizens' Advice Bureau. Um, we work with them closely so they can work with us, forward those people to us, so we hear what is going on, work with those people, and then get it right. Um, I'm going to move on to a different area, Mr Tompkins. You Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Good morning, Secretary Sec. Thank you for being with us this morning. I wanted to go back to some of the issues that the Convener was exploring with you right at the beginning of the session, I may, about um, the way in which DWP and the Scottish Government work together um, uh, in transferring what is a very significant set of responsibilities from the United Kingdom to, to Scotland uh, under the Scotland Act. 
2016. Um, and, and in particular, to ask if, if you could reflect on a story that appeared in the press just before Easter. Um, it appeared principally in the Scottish newspaper, The Daily Record, in which it was claimed that at the most recent meeting of the Joint Ministerial Working Group on Welfare, which you referred to, uh, I think, um, uh, in your opening statement, um, that um, Scottish government officials have been talking with your officials um, to seek to slow down the transfer of, um, in particular, responsibility over disability assistance from the UK um, to Scotland. Are, are you aware, as Secretary of State, of any conversations going on between um, Scottish government officials and UK government officials about the pace and slowing down the pace of the transfer of the devolved responsibilities under the Scotland Act? Well, what um, we know we need to see, and I wouldn't want to go on to, into a sort of a, a, a private meeting that we had, but what I do know is that we do need more detail to come through for these disability benefits. We need to know at a pace and quicker what it is that uh, the Scottish Government would like to do with these benefits. Uh, the Scotland Act is in place. Things have moved on. There is devolved powers to Scotland. So really, for them to be able to deliver things in a safe and timely manner and not need agencies' agreements with us, which we've now got to help give the carer's allowance the extra amount to not have that, we need the information coming forward at a pace. And, and is it your evidence, Secretary State, that that information is not coming forward at the moment from the Scottish Government, even privately, internally, to, to DWP? For, I, I repeat what I've said, for those benefits, we need more information coming forward, and we need it coming forward quicker and with greater clarity. So is the, um, g given the current, um, I mean, y y y because the n nature of intergovernmental negotiations or intergovernmental communications within the United Kingdom tends to be, as you just described it, private, although we as the Scottish Parliament are entitled to see the minutes of meetings of um, uh, a, a joint um, uh, meetings such as the Joint Ministerial Working Group on Welfare, and we haven't seen the minutes of the most recent meeting yet, even though that meeting was months and months ago now. Um, and as I understand it, that is because the Scottish Government have refused to sign off those minutes. That was the story in the Daily Record, at any rate. But the, um, you will know more um, about the nature of the Scottish Government's preparedness for the transfer of disability benefits than, than we are entitled to know as parliamentarians whose job it is to hold the Scottish Government to, to account. So can I ask you this question? Um, is it your view or is it the view of your department that the Scottish Government is going to be ready to deliver disability assistance in full before the next Scottish election, which is in, scheduled to be in May 2021? Or is that, in your judgment, unlikely because of the slow pace that the Scottish Government are proceeding with at the present time? What I will add, and maybe one of my officials would like to add to this, is we will put in place, should that not be the case, agency agreements, because what we need to make sure is that um, claimants in Scotland get uh, the support they need. So we do need to get that clarity, get that certainty on how those changes uh, are going to be made because for the DWP to work with people to give them that information to make sure that they've had the right time to be able to do it, implement it, we need to know what that uh, is. Um, so at the same time, we will have to put measures in place to ensure that if the Scottish Government can't do it, then we will no doubt end up continuing to do it through agency agreements. I don't know if anybody wants to add to that. So. Um so I work with Scottish Government, my opposite number, so we work all the time to be considering uh, potential plans for the future, of course. Um, in terms of the first wave, where everything is on track to deliver the first wave of the devolved benefits, um, we're hoping to get clarity fairly soon, as the Secretary of State says, about the next wave and what that, and what that will comprise of. Um, for DWP, it's the, the sooner we have that information, the more we can build in the time to develop the support, um, the change the IT, make sure we've got our staff trained and so forth. All the things that need to happen, supporting Scottish Government in whatever way we can to make that happen. But um, it's not... Uh, so un until we get that sort of clarity of detail, which I'm hoping that we will 
get fairly soon now um, that that will help us decide, you know, be, be able to be clear what what's going to be in the Scottish Government's plans, but obviously they are Scottish Government plans. Yeah. Okay, so final question for me on this. I mean, did, can you just specify a little bit what kind of issues it is that you need clarity about? So we have a, Scot a, a, a Social Security Scotland bill going through the Parliament at the moment, um, which is a framework piece of legislation that lays out the, the way in which devolved Social Security is to be delivered um, in, in Scotland um, at some point in the future, but there are no timelines attached um, to the bill, of course. By far the biggest single chunk um, is disability assistance. Um, and, that, and that's really been the focus of my questions, not the wave one um, powers, but the, but the disability assistance, um, which is, you know, we're talking about something like 1.8 billion pounds of um, expenditure annually in Scotland alone on disability assistance, all being devolved. Um, and the Scottish Government's commitment, the SNP's manifesto commitment, was that that would be delivered by the Scottish Government during the lifetime of this Parliament, that is to say before May 2021, before the next election. The stories in the papers, and I don't know if they're true or not, because they're just stories in the papers, but the stories in the papers suggest that there is now um, significant reason to doubt whether that timetable is likely to be adhered to or achieved or not. And that's what I'm trying to, to kind of to probe, to probe away at, the, set, the sense that, that you have um, in the DWP about the likelihood of that timetable being, um, being realised. So what kind of information is it about what the Scottish Government wants to do with disability assistance that it would need to share with you, which it has not yet shared with you, or indeed has not yet shared with the Parliament? Is it information about eligibility criteria? Is it information about quantum? Is it, is it information about who is going to conduct um, health assessments that are needed? Because we know, we know we have a provision in the bill that says that the health assessments will have to be conducted by a public employee. We don't yet know who those public employees are, of course. Is it that, what, what kind of information is it that is not being shared with DWP yet that would need to be shared with DWP by now in order to ensure that this ambitious timetable of the SNPs is realised? So, it, it, there's a sort of number of things. Um, Basically, uh, one of the things that we need to do in DWP is stop paying people at the point where Scottish Government are paying people. So there's things that we need to do in our systems to, to, to do that. So a key thing is when does that happen? What, what, what's the timing for that so that we can um, ensure that our IT systems uh, ensure that we don't get duplicate payments? Um, but equally... One of the things that comes into play is um, in what information the Scottish Government might need from us and we might need from them, because although the benefits themselves are being, these benefits themselves are being devolved, in quite a lot of cases we will continue to share the customer. So if people are on some of the reserve benefits as well, it's important to think about, A, information that Scottish Government might need, about that in order for eligibility purposes, uh, but also equally that we have information um, if, for example, uh, the uh, payment of a benefit in Scotland would trigger a premium or an increase. So it's about ensuring that customers are getting the right amount of money and, and, and so forth. And then, of course, we need to be able to make sure um, everything's in place. There's quite a lot of work that will go into making sure our staff understand that we've got a kind of customer, we understand what's going to happen to the customer from both stages of it. So it's the detail, really, of that. And obviously, um, depending on how Scottish Government uh, frame some of their assistance, uh, when you get into that detail of it, it may or may not need r different changes that we... So it's a kind of low level, but it does... It's really fundamental because our, you know, a lot of our systems um, for each of these benefits, and we, we kind of identified where we might need to make changes, but the detail of what might need to happen and when and the sequencing is really important so that we've got a proper um, plan for all of that and it's integrated because of all our systems interact with all our other systems. So to make it, you know, work efficiently, we need, we need that level of detail. So it's that kind of thing um, which Scottish Government colleagues do, you know, are well, are well aware of and that's what we talk about. So as I say, I'm hopeful that, you know, we get a plan fairly soon so that we can build in enough time to do all of that. 
So, whereas you mentioned it's, it's a framework document so far, and all of that detail, the vision, how it's going to work, who, I don't know, tribunals, support, all of these things will be in secondary legislation, none of which has uh, been seen yet, and that is what needs to be crafted and shaped. And where Mary there talks fundamentally about the delivery, the delivery is key to a benefit. That's what some of these questions have been about this morning. And understanding that and making sure it works for the individual is key. So that is what, um, within your parliament, you'll have to be pressing for that vision, that detail, and how it's going to uh, impact on Scottish claimants. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, can I bring in Mr Griffin, please? Thank you, Kimura. Good morning, Secretary of State. Um, if I could, I'd like to go back to universal credit, but to talk specifically about um, the flexibilities that are available to um, claimants in, in Scotland. Um, claimants in Scotland can opt to have more frequent payments and can opt to have uh, payments of housing benefit made direct to landlords. And we're told that the final costs of the DWP operating those flexibilities would be available to the Scottish Government and to Parliament this month. Um, I don't know if, whether you're able to, to give those final costs and perhaps see how those um, flexibilities have been operating from a DWP side. Well, um, obviously, we're working closely with the Scottish Government. Those flexibilities were brought in. I think that's been positive working together on what was required, what was wanted, uh, and how it works um, there. And we've been supporting them with the delivery on that um, and put significant sort of money into the support of these uh, systems to make it happen. Mary, where are we up to then? I'm afraid I don't know exactly where we are, but we can, we can find out for you. I don't know where we're up to in terms of um, information being available, but we can check. I don't know if you know Denise. Not the costs, no. Um, I mean, that would be played play through, presumably, to the fiscal framework discussions, isn't it? But we can... We'll, we'll come back to you on yeah. that. Concern the operating of them, Secretary of State, uh, I'll take that question. So it's been really positive. Uh, both our work coaches and our case managers in um, the service centres understand the choices uh, that customers have in front of them. The process is really simple for the customer, and if they get into difficulty in understanding the information that goes in as a prompt into their journal, then they've got the opportunity of phoning their case manager or talking to the work coach about it. So it's an opportunity for customers who would not have normally had either more frequent payments or direct payment to landlords picked up because they didn't fit the existing criteria, uh, which is primarily around budgeting issues, um, but other issues as well. They've got an opportunity of identifying for themselves if they want to adopt the choices that have been presented to them. Okay, thank you. The, the, the next area that I would like to see, and I think there's a majority in this parliament, um, on the universal credit flexibilities would be automatic split payments. I mean, we have um, people who suffer from domestic abuse, and domestic abuse takes many forms. It could be mental, physical, sexual, but often there is a financial element to, to, to domestic abuse. And the last thing that I think anyone would want to see is a social security system which enables financial domestic abuse to take place. Um, are you able to say, Secretary of State, whether you support the automatic splitting of payments across the UK um, and how far along are the discussions between the Scottish Government and the DWP to implement automatic split payments in Scotland, regardless of whether that will take place right across the whole of the UK? Um, I, I wouldn't be looking for automatic uh, split uh, payments, uh, but what we have done is ensure where, on cert in certain circumstances, people do need uh, a split payment for the uh, issues you raise, that will happen. Uh, but the benefit has been designed to look at the uh, 
uh, needs of a household, looking at the whole family, that is the children within it, that's the parents within it, uh, to make sure they understand the money that's coming into the, the house, the expenditure from that house, and as I said, looking at the support in the totality to making sure that you help people into work, making sure educational attainment and standards of the children uh, are as high as they can possibly be. So we're looking at the family unit or the household unit um, to support them as best as possible. So we wouldn't be looking to automatically split those, uh, but what we are doing is providing that split, that separation, as it were, of the funds where we know it is required. And separately, as uh, I mean, I, I don't agree. I think to alleviate the problem of financial domestic abuse, I think you have to automatically split. I think where there is an abused person in a household, um, they leave themselves open to further abuse if they were to come forward and to ask for a, a split. I think to, to stop that situation happening, it needs to be automatically split. But aside from that, um, it's clear the Scottish Government's position and many within this Parliament is that we do believe in automatic split payments and that there is the flexibility within universal credit for the Scottish Government to take those forward. So how have those discussions been progressing to allow that next stage of universal credit flexibilities to operate within Scotland? Uh, I'll, I'll pass to, to Mary there, but one thing I will say when um, somebody comes into and, and speaks with the work coach, we're very good at signposting people to third parties, to charities, to various other help they might need. And within a disclosure that they might need a separation of payment, actually, it could be the first time they get this extra help and support be able to speak to somebody else, obviously not the DWP person, but this third party, this charity, and actually that has been revolutionary to be able to help people get the support they might not be getting in their family unit, which you might not now get with just an automatic separation of funds. That's just another way uh, of looking at the extra help that our work coaches are giving. Um, in terms of the use of the further elements of the... Um, universal credit flexibilities choices um, I believe that officials from both departments are continuing to work on where that when that might be able to happen what the technical detail I think it's com I think it's particularly complex this one to actually do but um, I think uh, Scottish government uh, officials are, are talk talking to the UC program ab about that uh, and do you know do you have any uh, timetable or any expectation of when that can be I delivered? don't have a timetable Thank you. Um, Mr McPherson. Thank you, Convener. G good morning, all, and good morning, Secretary of State. Welcome to the Scottish Parliament. It's good to, to see you here after your, your predecessor uh, came as well. I think before I, I ask my questions, I'd just like to state that I think uh, all of the criticisms around the table here are not directed to DWP staff on the ground, who I know in the, in, in the most part are trying to, to do a, a good and, and difficult job. However, uh, I'd like to pick up on some of the points about universal credit and, and also some of the points that my colleague Mark Griffin's just raised there. The, I mean, I, I presume by being here today, Secretary of State, that you see the evolution of social security as a, as a priority. However, the delay that there's been in, and, and the admission of the de delay in allowing the Scottish Government to take forward its policy to abolish the bedroom tax at, at source says to me that there isn't a plan, a proper plan to prioritise social security and to enable the Scottish Government to fulfil its policy objectives. The fact that you and officials there were unable to answer really important questions about universal credit flexibilities in terms of the frequency of payment and payment uh, to landlords worries me greatly. The fact that split payments, which my colleague rightly said is a real priority across parties in this parliament, the fact that there's no timetable for enabling that to happen is deeply concerning. And all of this together says to me that there seems to be a continual pushback from the DWP to enabling social security devolution to happen in Scotland. There doesn't seem to be plans and it doesn't seem to be a priority. And I think that requires reflection on the basis of this meeting and some serious 
prioritisation of these issues in the DW. I appreciate you've got a lot on your plate at the moment. The department's in real crisis with cases that have come forward on PIP and other matters that have arisen in recent months. But this needs to be a priority and I would welcome your thoughts on that before I ask my next questions. Well, um, obviously you need reassurance on what is going on because there is certainly no pushback. Devolution has gone ahead. The Scotland Act has gone through. Uh, the extra support that Scotland, uh, Scotland, uh, Government Scotland has needed to allow for these flexibilities has happened. Those flexibilities are there. Uh, the extra powers that have gone to Scotland, so whether they want to add to a benefit, whether they want to uh, create a new benefit, whether they want to pay additional uh, payments to a benefit, are all there and at the disposal of the Scottish Parliament to take control of and move forward. So the devolution has gone through there. And then, as you say, when we work together on reserved matters, obviously understanding the sort of complexities of systems, of IT systems, of working together, um, yes, we've got to work through them and got to be given sufficient time to be able to do that. And that's why I said we are working regularly. Uh, the there is a team of senior officials meeting every month. Ministers are meeting quarterly. Lots of information has come across. There has been uh, project days, working days, uh, continually going forward. So actually, people are working at a pace. But what I do, and I had mentioned before, we need is the specific detail on certain matters that we are waiting for to be able to put these forward in a timely sure, I, way. But definitely, and so, as you said, that's why I'm here today, to say that that is right. Whilst I agree in the union, I do understand there is an appetite for greater devolution on the ground to make it work for Scotland, and that's exactly what I'm here to agree to and make sure that we're doing. Sure, and I, I, you know, I welcome the fact that you are showing this Parliament the, the respect it, it deserves and that it is more than uh, Lincoln County Council is. Uh, with all respect to Lincoln County Council, that you know, one of your, your colleagues made reference to this Parliament being synonymous with. But I think w what I'd be really, um, what I'm really looking for, Secretary of State, and what uh, this Parliament, and, and, uh, well, many members of this Parliament and, and certainly many members of the Scottish public are looking for, is a timetable, a commitment for, and I know you've, you've committed already to providing detail of, of when the flexibilities around universal credit in terms of regularity of payment and, and payment to landlords and, and, and welcome that, that correspondence coming as soon as possible. But we need a commitment on split payments and we need a commitment to bringing forward the ability for the Scottish Government to abolish the bedroom tax at source much sooner than, than uh, May 2020. Uh, th that's a, May 2020 is a delay. Previously, that there was a, a, an assumption that that would happen uh, quicker. Well, I answered that at the start. Uh, you have the commitment. We are doing that. It was never uh, agreed to be earlier, but we said we'd work together uh, to do it as soon as possible. Discretionary housing payments are there at the moment, which is how it is being resolved. So all of these matters are being done now. They are being dealt with now. It was just the extra bit of changing the IT at use at the uh, for UC that we always said would have to be done as soon as possible. But these issues that you're talking with are being dealt with. I know, Denise, you wanted to say a few yeah, words. So, so just for clarity, um, more frequent payments and direct payments to landlords, those choices are in. The, the bit that isn't, that I wasn't able to talk about, was the transfer of money. Well, to be honest, that's in the background. The important thing is that we've responded, we've changed the systems, and they're operational for customers in Scotland. So those things are in, and I, I just want to re-clarify. Those two items have been operating now for around about, um, well, it's from January. So. And, and as you say, the bit was, uh, what was the cost of that, which we can clarify for you, but actually having delivered it, the UK government has delivered it with and for Scotland because we said we would, and it's now in place. Well, obviously I welcome that, and I think that's demonstrative of the fact that split payments 
can, can be made to happen if there's a commitment on both sides to work together to, to, to deliver that as quickly as possible. And similarly, that the benefit, the abolition of the benefit tax at source could be done in a quicker way when uh, there's a focus and a determination on both sides. Very quickly, convener, uh, I just wanted to also say, uh, Secretary of State, I welcome your uh, step away from the fact, uh, the commitment to ending housing benefit for 18 to 21 year olds. I think that was a very, uh, there was strong opposition to that policy in this parliament. And that was a very welcome uh, move that you, you stepped away from that because of the wrong headedness of that policy and the fact that it wasn't really delivering anything um, positive for the taxpayer or uh, in causing uh, suffering to those affected. In a similar way, uh, as Alison Johnson pointed out, I think you should reconsider advances on universal credit. Uh, there's, uh, while there's been a commitment to uh, bringing those forward in a more timious manner, a more effective manner, the fact that those are still advances that have to be repaid uh, is something that is, from our experience of the evidence that we've taken, uh, detrimental. And in a similar way, the whole ethos of universal credit is based, in my view, and the views of many, on suspicion and assuming the worst in people instead of encouragement and, and help, which is a word you used earlier. There are people in the back of the audience behind you who've either campaigners or individuals who'd suffered greatly at the, the, the hands of welfare reform agenda. There are constituents who've cried in front of me in surgeries, and I know colleagues have been the same. This is a wrong-headed policy in the way that, the, in the ethos that it's being approached at the moment. And in the same way that you've changed your position on housing benefit for 18 to 21 year olds, my plea in good faith is that you take away from this committee to look again at universal credit and change it to be a supportive system rather than a cynical and critical system. And as well, I asked this to your, your predecessor, and I want to ask it to you as well today. First of all, to rethink because of this, the, 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 the consequences that it's having and also the, the fact that uh, you're on course to make more savings through uh, Social Security now than you were. And so the, the need for austerity is, is significantly less if there was a need for one at all. But also, I want to give you the opportunity to <coughs> apologise to the people behind you, the people across my constituency and the people across Scotland who've suffered greatly through the mistakes of social security reform, welfare reform, and I think are due that apology from the DWP for the suffering and distress that's been caused to them. Well, I, you know, the aim for universal credit is that it is a supportive system, that there is support, whether that's into work or whether that is support if you can't get into work with uh, social security payments there. <laughs> Can we suspend, please?
suspended at to session and please continue and what we were saying was universal credit is a supportive system and that's what it aims to be but I am not oblivious to people who are incredibly vulnerable or who are in need and obviously the gentleman um, felt he needed to have his points said about something uh, that was very important to him about somebody who was very vulnerable but what we aim to do with the money we spend from DWP which is nearly 200 billion pounds per year the department is the size of a country the size of Portugal or of Greece or of Chile. This is the kind of support we're giving 80,000 people working there to make sure that we reach out to the most vulnerable. So we do that. Um, if anybody doesn't get that support, it is not through lack of trying because that's what people are employed to do is to reach out and support people. Uh, it is important that we hear every instance, and it is important that we work as hard as we possibly can to support everybody who needs our help. But it is about making sure we have the most effective system to help people and employ the most dedicated people in our job centres to help people and that is what uh, we do and we have as best oversight as we possibly can learning from it all the time as best as we possibly can thank you I just uh, what? Oh, i'm really no conscious problem, of time and i've got two other members who want to come in on your areas so i think we've covered that area quite extensively miss johnson you wanted to come in no. on sorry i thought you had another year to come in miss mcneil would you like to come in Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I listened carefully to what you said to the committee about the good points about the universal credit system and I do agree that the reason for introducing it that it could be much more flexible is a good one but, but so far you don't seem to have acknowledged any of the questions put to you and any of the evidence that there has been, you surely must have heard the same evidence as we've heard. I mean, for example, I mean, it is a fact that on housing benefit alone in Scotland, those who transfer to universal credit are £24 a week worse off. So surely there must be an acceptance that there's a lot more fixing to do than you've acknowledged to the committee already. Um, I mean, that's just housing. Others, as you've heard on the table this morning, the, the, the increase in the number of food banks in areas where universal credit has been rolled out has definitely increased. So the idea is right. And like Ben McPherson, I, I welcome that you're, you're the Secretary of State that has began to fix some of this, as you did, in doing the right decision in rolling back the decision for 16 to 24, which we all welcome. But there's more fixing to be done if universal credit is to be a better system. And surely you would accept that there is much more fixing to do. Um, and the housing figure alone, I think, speaks for itself. Um, I, I am listening to the issues that people raise, whether it is the you know, Citizens Advice Bureau, whether it is the Trussell Trust, uh, whether it is action groups on the ground. That's what I spend uh, most of my day doing is meeting with those people, meeting with claimants to see where is it working, how could we make it better, how could we implement or alter uh, some, of, uh, some of the conditions of universal credit and you'll see those have changed where we felt it wasn't working to uh, make sure it, it did. Um, and as I've said, you've got to look in the round two. So when I look at how things have changed from 2010 to now in Scotland, and I see that unemployment has nearly halved. When I look at the child poverty statistics in Scotland, and it has decreased across all four of the main measures between the three years between 2016-17 compared to the three years between 2009-10, 
and when I meet with and work with the all parliamentary party group on hunger and look at the reports from Trussell Trust and Oxford University who talk about the overlaying and the complex reasons behind people going to food banks and how we need to support people going forward and whether that is in debt management, whether that is in support. Um, we're trying to do all of those and I do see positive figures from Scotland of people in work creating businesses, the fact that those but poverty sorry to measures have but do dropped. you accept though that fair enough, but do you accept though that there is detriment to many people too? I mean the figure that I use is a real figure. Those who have transitioned to universal credit on average are twenty four pounds worse off on their housing benefit element. Does that not suggest that there is a structural problem because the promise that was made was that when you transition to universal credit different system that it wouldn't affect your overall income. That was the promise that was made. But as I keep saying, you can't um, unlock how the economy is changing because social security, the economy, people in work, all are linked together and what we're seeing is uh, employment going up, what we're seeing is unemployment going down, what we're seeing is the highest wage rises or the fastest wage rises for the lowest uh, in society through the introduction of the national living wage. We're also seeing we're taking people out of taxation, removing people from paying taxation altogether. So all of those So there's no changes. detriment. You, you don't think that people who have transitioned, to, is, that, is, that, is, that your, is that what you're saying to the committee today? You don't see that there has been any detriment you only see the good side. Is that what you're saying to the community? I today? see what everybody saw was the legacy benefits that were in place were not working. They were locking people into unemployment at the 16-hour rule. These things and cases that you are raising now, they existed in the legacy benefits. What we're seeing is an improvement from those legacy be benefits to a new, modern, more simplified um, and swifter system. Um, so that's what we're moving towards, making what was there better and to um, try and indicate that the legacy benefits were better is not true. And also what you're seeing overlaying this is the extra support and the growth of the economy here on the ground. And you've got to take all those component parts and we've got to do the best we can in the position we are to make a, a, a better system for the people who are claiming. And that's what we're doing. We're all on a journey. We're on a journey together to make everybody's lives the best they can, but that's to help them into work, that's to help with job progression, that's to give better uh, education and to improve people's lives. Can I bring in Mr Balfour? It's on another area, sorry. It's, that's, we, we, we do know that we're, we're a bit tight for time, but another area is fine okay. at the moment. Um, good morning, Secretary of State, and thank you again uh, for coming this morning. Um, I have two quick questions, if that's okay. The first one is in regard to, um, following on my question from Adam Tompkins around PIP and DLA and attendance allowance. Obviously, we haven't yet seen the regulations of how it will work in practice. But if we end up with different criteria for people getting PIP, what difficulties do you foresee um, will cause um, that for um, DWP? and how much work will be involved in providing the information to Scottish Government in regard to that. Um, and the second question is just changing the subject really completely. Uh, and that is looking at uh, employability. I think we all agree that the best way out of poverty for everyone is, is employability for individuals and, and for families. One of the areas that I, I have a concern around is around disability, and I know your department is doing work on that. But a number of employers have spoken to me recently about how there is obviously division between employment law, uh, devolved and non-devolved. And Scottish Parliament have, or Scottish Government have their website with information about employability on theirs, and you have stuff on that. 
Would there be a possibility of a conversation between the two governments about bringing together information so that there's a single portal that employers and employees can go to to find out what both governments are doing around that so that devolution isn't stopping people getting into employment? Um, so in terms of the... Obviously, it is entirely for the Scottish Government to decide what they want to do in the areas that are being devolved. Um, <clears throat> And so, in a sense, the main thing is, <clears throat> are there elements of the eligibility, eligibility which would require information from DWP because they relate to other parts of the system? So that's sort of part of it. Um, and I guess the other part of it would be how our, our sort of set of premiums uh, that we pay, in uh, support we pay um, in some of our uh, means-tested benefits relates to current eligibility, eligibility. So one of the things we'd need to work out is what impact that then might have on the allocation of premiums. So that would be the kind of example where you could see how either it's information flows and understanding exactly what would be required, um, but also the kind of the, the, the way it feeds into to the other benefits. Um, as we've been, as I was mentioning, we've been talking and working with um, Scottish Government on the Wave 1, which includes the Carers' Allowance Supplement, which we're going to be supporting Scottish Government to pay in, uh, in the summer, but also the, uh, the Best Start grant for maternity and funeral, funeral payments. Through all of those, we work out, as they work through the detail of their policy, what, what might be required of the department in terms of information, but also has it got any wider impacts that we need to take into account? So those would be the kind of things. And working together, uh, that's exactly what we want to do. So if we could work together or, and, and create a portal, obviously we've done that with the landlord portal, um, that's what we should be uh, looking to do. Yes. Can I just come in there, Secretary So we work with... Uh, Business Enterprise Scotland and also S Skills Development Scotland. So, you know, we've got the f the relationships to actually come together. So, if you're signalling something that needs to be looked at, as Secretary of State says, I don't see a problem in us coming together and finding the right vehicle, because we put access to, for example, Skills Development website into our work coaches, so that we've actually got the right information flowing through, um, because it's different to England and Wales. So, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I think this is going to be our, our final question, very briefly, um, Ms Johnson. Thanks. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that there's almost, almost universal condemnation of the two-child limit um, on tax credits um, within this Parliament. And, um, you know, we're speaking about how, how universal credit is progressive. I think um, that this policy shows that that's absolutely not the case. But you'll be aware that um, there are assessors in Scotland who will not take part um, in this policy, so I'd like to know if there are plans to publish statistics showing the number of people affected by the two-child limit in universal credit and whether there is any evidence of a lower take-up um, of exceptions in Scotland due to the exception forms not being completed. Um, so the claimants who are on those benefits will continue getting benefits and obviously the child uh, benefit itself will continue for uh, every child. It's the tax credit uh, element that will change. And uh, this has been worked out on the basis that people who are uh, claiming um, have the same considerations of those people who are working and uh, paying for their bills. So it is again looking for a fairness between people who are claiming and people who are working that they're all considering and making the same decisions in uh, life. Um, but as I said, the child benefit will continue for every number of children. It will be looking at the tax credit uh, changes there. Um, but you'll be aware that the um, Scottish Women's Aid and Rape Crisis Scotland, for example, have refused, um, rightly in my view, to act as third party referrers. So is your government undertaking any research at all to see whether or not that will impact on entitlement in Scotland? And what you're referring to there is the understanding that the government um, and the um, 
extra support the government's put in place for people who didn't or weren't able to uh, make decisions over how many children they've had and they have indeed got extra children. So more support will be put there and we've said we'll make allowances in those instances and you're right we've said we will refer people so personal questions aren't asked from the DWP staff or uh, HMT staff and we'll refer them and work with whether that is third party groups as you mentioned or it could be health professionals or it could be uh, other suitable people who could help people um, I do hope that some of those organisations um, don't decide not to work with us because actually what we're doing is providing extra help and support to those people who do but we will continue working uh, to make sure that the people who need that extra benefit will get it, and maybe it will be uh, through um, other organisations and an extra route. But of course, we will closely monitor that situation. I mean, do you, as a minister, really, you actually are comfortable with the idea that a woman has to prove non, -consen non consensual conception in order to access an entitlement? What we're doing is providing extra help where people have got. Um, more children that they couldn't have planned and were providing that extra support. There will be no uh, questions like that asked, as I said, from the DWP or from HMT uh, and people will be supported and th uh, shown to the uh, various other organisations and again, this could give them an opportunity to talk about maybe something that's happened that, that, that they never had before. So it is potentially double support there, them getting the money they need uh, and maybe an outlet which they might possibly need. But it's potentially also incredibly invasive and upsetting um, if women are being forced to put on the record a um, situation or circumstance that they wish to remain entirely private in order to access entitlement. Um, there will be no... Um invasive or delving questions asked. As I said, they will speak to people. They've obviously come forward uh, with this uh, reasoning and for this extra support, and it will be done in the most sensitive manner. That is obviously key to uh, what is happening here. But it is in the light of providing this extra financial support that they seek. Thank you, Katrina. Okay. Can we suspend again? Sorry. We go back into session, please. Can I thank the Secretary of State? and her officials for their attendance. Um, we very much value this opportunity for this dialogue between us um, and look forward to that happening again. I'm sure there's many areas that perhaps we haven't covered in detail and I would welcome the opportunity for the committee to write to you if we have any further, further follow-up questions. Thank you. Um, I'm formally closing the meeting. The next official meeting will be on the 3rd of May as next week we have the stage three debate on uh, the Social Security Bill and to close the meeting.